Welcome, and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. During the question and answer session, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. And now I'll turn today's meeting over to Linda Abuzizi. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, and good afternoon for those of you joining on the East Coast, and good morning for those of you joining from the West Coast. Thank you for joining us for our first webinar from our Exporting to Mexico webinar series. The name of this webinar is Exporting to Mexico webinar series, Harmonized System Code Basics and Special Certificates webinar. And I'm pleased to note that we have more than 10 people registered for this webinar today. Uh, my name is Lavea Brazizi, and I'm a Senior International Trade Specialist for the Global Knowledge Center at the Department of Commerce. And this webinar is being brought to you in cooperation by the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service in Monterey, Mexico, and Accent. And I'd like to welcome all the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service clients and other participants joining us from all across the United States to understand shipment compliance requirements requested by Mexican authorities. In this webinar, you will also understand the importance of proper classification of your products and equipment that will help you avoid mistakes, fines, and penalties when exporting your goods to Mexico. I would like to also let you know that this is a series which is the first of seven that we will be offering to all of our clients uh, regarding issues pertaining particularly to Mexico. And I just would like to let everyone know that our office in Monterey, Mexico is a resource where everyone can get the information that is needed when they have exporting questions um, through between the United States and Mexico. And now in a moment, uh, before I, I go through, um, after I go through logistics, I will turn this presentation over to Mr. Charles Redding, who is the Director of Operations of the Ascent Company. And he will be available at the end of this presentation to answer your questions. And contact information will also be provided. Now, just to go over logistics, for those of you who just joined, you can still log into this webinar by entering the UR website and passcode for instructions that were sent to you by email. And we do have a few housekeeping details to make sure everyone gets the most benefit from today's webinar. You will be able to hear this presentation via your telephone and view it simultaneously via your computer. So if you are not hooked up through both, please take a moment to do this. And if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please press star zero anytime during this presentation. Now, during this webinar, we will be taking voice and written questions. To ask a voice question, please press star one. To ask a written question, we invite you to type in your questions on your screen as they occur to you during this presentation. There is an icon for letters Q and A on the upper left-hand side of your screen. Q and A stands for question and answers, where you can click and type in your questions anytime during this presentation. And we will compile these questions and present them as time allows during this presentation. And any type question which is not answered during this webinar due to time constraints, we will get back to you via a personal email. I'd like to just uh, go over for right now uh, the agenda. So um, after um, my introduction, I will be uh, introducing Charles Redding, who uh, will talk about harmonized codes. But as I stated before, our, our office in Monterey, Mexico, is the best resource for you to understand more about this series and, and topics regarding to exporting between U.S. and Mexico. And if you are interested in knowing more about this, please join us with these other webinars that we have going on. And now um, I'd like to introduce live uh, online, and looks like uh, from the United States, Mr. Charles Redding, who's the Director of Operations for AskSent. Charles, thank you very much for joining us. Hello, good afternoon. I'd like to start today just by explaining some, some brief, give some brief descriptions on what the harmonized tariff system is. What it is, it provides duty rates for virtually every item that exists. The HTS is a reference manual that is about the size of an unabridged dictionary. Uh, on my desk, I have one, and it takes up about half my desk. The harmonized commodity description coding system of Tariff nomenclature is an internationally standardized system of descriptions and numbers for classifying internationally traded products developed and maintained by what's called the World Customs Organization. They're based in Brussels, Belgium, with about 170 members. The United States and Mexico are both members of this organization. 
The United States system is organized into 22 sections and 99 chapters. It also includes the general rules for interpretation and explanatory notes. Based on the International Harmonized Commodity Coding and Classification System established by the World Customs Organization, the Harmonized Tariff Schedule for the United States, enacted in 1988, is the primary resource for determining a tariff classification for goods imported into or exported from the United States. The U.S. International Trade Commission is the government department responsible for periodically updating it. It is made available in a variety of electronic formats by both the U.S. ITC as well as the U.S. Customs Bureau. Tariff numbers can be found on, at the following website that's listed here on the, on, on this, on the presentation where you can look up uh, your specific tariff number and, and uh, prepare those as you're getting ready to classify. It is important for importers and exporters to know their product's tariff numbers for the following reasons. One is to determine applicable import tariff rates and the regulations and whether a product qualifies for a preferential tariff under a free trade agreement. If you do not know the number, you will not be able to confirm the duty rate. Also, for everything that's exported, uh, a shipper's export declaration is now called the AES or Automated Export Systems Required. All shipments with a value of greater than $2,500 require an AES filing, and for this you must have a tariff classification. To complete shipping documents, such as a certificate of origin, you are also required to place a six-digit subheading tariff number on the national certificates of origin in order for it to be valid in Mexico. The six-digit number must also match the Mexican tariff number in order to apply the preferential duty rates. So why a harmonized system? Well, it helps companies identify potential foreign markets for domestic goods. All members of the World Customs Organization are required to make import and export statistics publicly available. You can go online with a WCO participating country and look for the commodity number, and that will tell you how much they're importing and how much they're exporting of that commodity. It also helps track the activities of your competitors. You know, it would be nice to know what your competitors and where your competitors are exporting goods overseas. It will tell you where similar uh, products are being shipped, quantity shipped, and the revenue generated from these shipments. It also helps track foreign import tariffs. Some companies need to know what the duty rates overseas will be when they make arrangements with, foreign, with a foreign customer to pay these. Sometimes we have customers that are willing to pay the duty rates in a foreign country. To do this, they need to know what the foreign uh, tariff number will be so they can calculate those duties. They also need to determine whether the product qualifies for preferential treatment under a free trade agreement and also to confirm domestic and foreign import regulations. Tariff numbers determine what non-duty related restrictions and permits are required. If you are prepared for these, this will help avoid costly delays at a foreign port of entry. And they're also needed again to prepare the AES filing for exports from the U.S. and also certificates of origin. So how does it work? Well, as stated above, the, 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 the tariff book consists of 22 chapters, 22 sections and 99 chapters, I apologize. In the U.S., all products are described by a 10-digit number that is broken down by chapter, heading, subheading, the subheading for duties, and then a commodity code. Mexican numbers are only eight digits, and the books that we use here are about 3,500 pages long and has about 17,000 different HTS numbers for classification. In this example, the customer is asking us to, to uh, classify a salmon. We first must have available particular details regarding the product. Is it fresh or frozen, whole or filleted, canned, cooked, and even where it was caught? These details will determine which chapter, heading, subheading, and the correct commodity code. My picture is a whole fish caught in Alaska for a Pacific salmon. So for this, we know that Chapter 3 includes fresh fish. All fresh fish and crustaceans will be found in Chapter 3. Each chapter has explanatory notes we use to help us classify a product correctly. The next section is the heading, which is more specific. In this case, 0302 is now fresh fish. To separate it from other chapters, that may be for cooked fish or filet fish. The next section is the subheading. This even becomes more specific, giving us a description for Pacific salmon. If this were an Atlantic salmon, we'd be in the wrong chapter. Finally, you'll see the 10-digit commodity code, which is Chinook King salmon. If this were sockeye salmon or another type of salmon, it would be a different commodity code. It is important to note that just last year, all salmon was listed in a different tariff number. However, the U.S. Uh, the International Trade 
Commission changed the classifications to separate Pacific salmon from Atlantic salmon. So if you called me and asked me to classify salmon, I will not be able to provide you an accurate tariff classification, which is just a simple description of salmon. I will have to ask you to be more specific so we can understand better which would be the correct tariff classification. This is very important. The next page, I want to talk about how we classify. Goods must be classified by the most specific description. So if just we have salmon, that's not a specific description. We need more specifics to make sure we know what and what the exact number is going to be for your classification. The first hurdle that international traders face when classifying a new product is to answer the most basic question, what is it? Assigning an HTS code may be simple, but it's critical when considering the risk associated with getting it wrong. Before you even start looking up a commodity code, you need to know the materials, functions, and specifications of your product. It also goes without saying that what, whoever is assigned the task of classifying the product must know everything about your product. So familiarize with the headings, the explanatory notes, and wording. Start at the chapter level, and then go forward to the heading, the subheading level, until you find the correct number. The government can and does audit importers and exporters and request additional information on how you determine the tariff number. In order to demonstrate reasonable care, I recommend that you document and record the thought process used to arrive at your tariff classification. We have a system created for our classifier where he documents how he arrived at the tariff number. He will load photos, uh, emails from the customers, anything that he's using to make sure he has the correct classification. Down the road, someone might ask how he did it, and he'll be able to use this to help give a clear and quick explanation. On the next slide, you're just looking at a page from the U.S. Harmonized System. This is from Chapter 8 concerning edible fruits and nuts. At the beginning of each chapter, customs provide some additional notes when you begin looking for a tariff number. For Chapter 8, you're warned that inedible nuts and fruits will not be found here. When you look up the tariff number, you will see that the exact tariff description, unit of measure, which can be used to calculate dues and taxes, general duty rates for those countries considered most favored nations, and these are countries where the U.S. has a good trade relationship. Special are for those countries where the U.S. has a free trade agreement. And then finally, Section 2 or the other countries that either the United States doesn't have most favorable uh, trade relations with or, or a free trade agreement with. So this is how you can kind of look up the number and kind of determine what the, the duty rate is going to be for that product. Okay, so here's the Mexican harmonized system. Now, the Mexican harmonized system is very similar to the U.S. harmonized system. Uh, it's an online report that you can go online and see and look up those numbers for yourself. It's all in Spanish, so if you don't speak Spanish, you have to get somebody to help you with. Here you'll notice that the first eight digits of the, of the tariff number, 080910 for Chavacanos, which is apricots, will match the U.S. also for the export. After the sixth digit, the numbers are different. Mexico uses eight and U.S. uses ten. You also see also here the unit of measure used, which is in kilograms. You also see other information, for example, EVA, which is VAT tax, is exempt. So this importation, they'll only pay a, a duty rate that won't pay VAT tax. The duty rate for this, for countries that are not in a free trade agreement with Mexico, will be 20%, which is what it means they are on sale. Below that, you'll see the import and export re regulations for this type of product. Both of these will require a final sanitary certificate from SICARPA. SIGARPA is the Mexican uh, Secretary of Agriculture. So what are some common mistakes that people make when they're trying to classify a product? And we see this all the time. At our warehouse, we receive shipments all the time from customers wanting to ship to Mexico or shipping from Mexico back to the United States, and they provide us documents that frequently have some errors on them with the, in relation to the tariff classification. And as a large custom broker, we, we have to prepare these export documents for foreign companies. We occasionally find mistakes that Porter has made listed in the tariff numbers on the certificate of origin. People with little experience classifying products will typically find and use the easiest and simplest description in order to, to, to provide the tariff classification. They'll look up apricot, for example, and grab the first number that comes out without checking the specifics for the particular product. 
this doesn't work this way. You have to make sure you know the full description of your product. Another common error that's made is sometimes the governments will change tariff codes, and this is based on the WCO's recommendations. The World Customs updated the listing just last year, and it's related to a lot of changes made this year in, in the tariff classifications. Sometimes exporters will neglect to keep their tariff numbers up to date and ever changing commodity numbers. In the example of salmon, if the import does not update to the certificate origin, as he had in the past with both Atlantic and Pacific salmon, his certificate will not be valid for customs. <clears throat> if someone asks me to classify, for example, uh, leather shoes, this happens sometimes where they'll say, Charles, can you help me give a, a classification for, for shoes? And I'll say, sure. I'll look it up and I'll find the tariff number and it's pretty easy to classify. But when, what if the shoe, when it arrives here, rather than just being a shoe, is now an orthopedic shoe? They didn't give me the full uh, detail of the product that we're going to import. Those little details will change the tariff numbers. In order to make sure we're correct, we usually go to explanatory notes. These are notes in the tariff books that tell us where to look for a specific product or if there's something about the product that we have to be careful of when we're classifying it, that something may not be included, or if it has this characteristic, it will be another place. Another common error, and one of the most common errors made by exporters using an after certificate is when they call it a part of something else. So, for example, you can say that something is a part of something else very easily. I can say a screw is a part of a door, or the screw is a part of a chair. But here there are specific rules and tariff classifications to make that determination. We'll look on the next page. For example, in the first error, you can see for apricots. Now, apricots, if you told me to classify an apricot, these are just some of the, the possibilities for classification on an apricot. Is it fresh? Is it peeled? Is it dried, preserved? Is it the pulp? Is it apricot juice? Is it apricot? Um, it could be anything. So be very specific when you're looking at the tariff numbers. Here's another example of the errors we see with parts of. Again, a good can only be considered a part of when it does not have a specific tariff number and is also an essential part of the finished good. A fan manufacturer, for example, would say that everything he ships and everything in his plant will be part of a fan someday. And we can all understand why he would say that, but Customs says something very different when determining when a good can be considered a part of. And this is only if it doesn't have a specific tariff number and it's definitely a part of the it is part of the complete good. So this will be lower some pictures of the fan blade, a fan motor, a finger guard, and a screw. These are all items used to assemble a fan without a doubt. But which of these can be considered for customs in a tariff classification? On the next page, you'll see here the pictures. The fan blade is a part of a fan. There's not a specific tariff number for fan blades today. Now, if tomorrow they make a specific tariff number, then that number, then that fan blade will now no longer be considered a part of a fan. It will actually become uh, a fan of its own, of its own tariff number. Motors, for example, here. Now, motors are never considered a part of anything. There's a specific tariff number for motors, so motors will always go into the specific tariff numbers for based on the on the characteristics that the motor has. The next picture is of the finger guard. Now, finger guard, there are no specific tariff numbers for finger guards. So in this case, that finger guard would also be considered a part of a fan. And finally, the screw. This is one of the most common errors that we always get. We always get an after certificate where they're calling a screw a part of something else. Again, screws have specific tariff numbers based on what are they made of, the size, the, the, and, the, and the diameter. And that's usually what we use to determine what the tariff number is. It will never be a part of something else. Now, I want to give everybody time for a little quick quiz here. Now, should all of these be shipped together on the same truck, how should these be classified? Which tariff numbers would you put on this mattress certificate? Would you list out the fan on one line, the motor, the finger guard, and the screw? The answer is, well, not, well they actually wouldn't. You would actually complete, this is actually a complete fan when shipped together, even if it's unassembled.
My recommendation is when you're shifting an unassembled good, always consider it as a finished good. The, the fact that it's unassembled doesn't mean that you have to uh, classify each individual part. One of the things most importers fear the most is the U.S. from the U.S. government is a CVB Form 28 or Form 29. Customs officials can and frequently do request for you to explain how you determine your tariff number, and you have only 30 days to reply. This form is sent by U.S. mail, gets passed around your company, and then finally you find it, which is left with very little time to provide a full and complete response to their request. You must be able to demonstrate how you arrived at the tariff numbers. Please document each step you took to find the tariff number. Customers and customs will require a complete explanation, not just, you know, that's what I thought it was, but really a documented list of how you arrived at that number. If you do not reply accordingly, be prepared to pay fines, penalties, and the payment of back taxes when it's determined that you were incorrect. You will also be responsible for paying interest, as these can be requested five years after the import date. Document everything so that you're prepared to validate concisely how you classify. If you use a custom broker and or import specialist, then make sure they provide you with their detailed explanation as well. And keep it for your records. Again, these forms frequently arrive at importers from the government who are going to ask, how did you determine that number? They can provide you with additional documentation to confirm how they interpreted each tariff number. On the next page, I had uh, the picture didn't make it onto the slide, but there was a picture of a, what looked like a truck and a forklift all put together. And here we have to look at the dangers of if it's not exactly correct, there's a risk there of missing tax, being and those taxes being owed to the government. The next picture, you'll see the little dolls there. Now, dolls pay 12% duty, and toys pay 6% duty. This is actually a pretty famous case in customs where Marvel Comics for years fought with the government to say, these are not dolls, these are toys. Dolls in this specific description says that they're human-like. They argue that these are mutants and they're not human-like. Actually, after 10 years of fighting, Marvel won the case and saved it quite a, a substantial amount on customs duties that were paying for reputations in the, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Be aware that the HTS can be very complicated. If you self-classify an item and the classification is not correct, this mistake can be very costly. Therefore, I advise you to speak directly with an import specialist if duty rate information is critical to your operations. Experts spending, who spent years learning how to properly classify an item in order to determine its correct duty. Our company classifier has been with us for over 30 years, and he knows a lot about everything. And to be a good classifier, you definitely have to know a lot about everything. You might want to know the, du the rate of duty on a T-shirt, for example. Classification specialist will know what to ask. He'll need to know what the grammage is, for example. That's something that a lot of people would know to ask. Did the clothes come from Spain or did they come from Colombia? Where did they come from? Where was the T-shirt assembled? Does it have any synthetic fibers? A lot of questions is on a simple T-shirt. Something for most people, just something very simple to, to classify or describe, can be very difficult to do so when you're trying to design a, a tariff number. So please be aware that the duty rate you request is only as good as the information you provide. The actual duty rate of the item you import may not be what you think it should be as a result of your research. Customs makes the final determination of what the correct duty rate is, not the import. For very specific duty information on a particular item, you may request a binding ruling from U.S. Mexican Customs. You may also receive guidance by contacting a customs broker like our, like our company or an import, uh, import specialist who can help you. Import approval of any product is subject to the import country's rules and regulations as interpreted by their customs officials at the time of entry. Another thing we want to talk about today was the certificates. And there are several different certificates that are required for importing or exporting a product through customs. The, the requirement of these certificates is usually determined by the tariff classification number. So when somebody provides a tariff number, you can go to the system and it'll tell you, 
hey, you need this certificate or that certificate or this document or this permit. And that's how we kind of follow what's required when we're presenting things to customs. The most common certificate required from customs is called certificate of origin. Now, these are frequently used for free trade agreements where if you want to save money on the duties, you'll get your certificate of origin specifically for that free trade agreement. But everything that we import and export here, we have to declare a country of origin. And not everything has a country of origin printed on it. Uh, every day we receive products in our warehouse that have no country of origin markings. But we have to declare that to customs when we cross. If we're not correct, there could be fines and delays. So one of the things we always ask our, the exporters to provide us with is a document that says this is where it was made. And then that way we can use that when we get ready to prepare these for customs clearance. Proof of origin is something very important, especially for countervailing duties. This means that uh, certain commodities or their tariff numbers are not <laughs> accepted as freely as they are from certain countries. Um, a product made in China, for example, may have a countervailing duty against it. And this countervailing duty may be 300 or 400 percent. To avoid that, sometimes the exporters are required to present these specific certificates of origin just to say this is where it's made so that there's no chance that the customs will believe that it's perhaps made in another place. Another common certificate that we, we request from the exporters is called the Sugar Re-Export Certificate. And the, the Refined Sugar Re-Export Program is designed to facilitate the use of domestic refining capacity to export refined sugar into the world market. For Mexican Customs, they want to know that these uh, goods are being imported. The sugar contents do not benefit from that program from the USDA. Mexican, for sugar or products that contain sugar, Mexican government will ask the broker to provide them a certificate that says from the exporter that these don't contain any of that sugar, that the sugar that's in there did not benefit from the re-export program. If the exporter cannot provide the document, then additional duties and taxes will be levied against the importation for the, for the sugar content of what's being imported. Again, this comes from the United States Department of Agriculture. So if you're, you're exporting or getting ready to export something that has sugar in it, be prepared to get the certificate. The next is certificate of free sale. A lot of companies and countries, well, a lot of countries, want to make sure that the, the products being imported for consumer use are safe. And one of the ways that they do that is to confirm that if it's being imported, that the exporter country uses it. Um, a fear exists that if you import something, a medicine or a type of food, that's not consumed in the country that's exporting it, that perhaps there's something wrong with it. So the certificate of free sale is a document required in Mexico for certain commodities, such as pharmaceuticals or uh, foods. And this certifies that the specific goods are normally and freely sold in the exporting country, and that it, it complies with all the regulations in the exporting country as well. A certificate of free sale can be required to show that goods are available for retail and sale, that they comply with the exporting country's regulations, and that they are suitable for use by their consumers. It is issued by state and local, state and federal agencies, and the FTA. COFEPRIS is the company, is the Secretary of Health in Mexico, and they're the ones that check and make sure these goods are good for importing and for, for people in the country to consume them. On the final slide is a list of several certificates and who uh, manages those through the customs. So, for example, the next one is FSIS, which is the Food and Safety Inspection Service of the USDA. This certifies that meat products, including the shipment, are from animals that received anti-mortem and post-mortem inspection and were found to be healthy. It is basically certifies that the meat was found safe and healthy for human consumption. The certificate lists specific information regarding the exporter and where the meat was processed. Slaughter date and lot numbers and every other information required from the meat is also declared on the certificate. And these will be required if you're trying to export some, some type of meat or poultry into Mexico. One of my recommendations for these certificates is you should always stay in contact with your foreign uh, importer to confirm documents and certificates required in the importing country. These things can change frequently. It could be today, this is what's required. It could be tomorrow, customs law changes, and now you have to deal with a whole new uh, list of regulations. Your foreign companies are normally best equipped to search, research these requirements with local and state and federal authorities. And certificates should always be prepared before the goods are shipped to avoid delays when corrections are required. Never wait till the last minute. Occasionally shipments arrive here and they don't comply with the correct information or the right certificate. While that's being fixed, the shipment sits here, 
and there may be demerges or additional charges, just having it, having it sit by, waiting for uh, the correct documents to arrive. This is also included for certificates of origin. Very frequently, those are invalid because the tariff classifications are incorrect, or they were unsigned, or, or there's other um, parts of the documents that were just not completed properly. When this happens, there are delays, and these delays can be very costly for your customer and, uh, and for yourself if you're responsible for the uh, drainage from here to Mexico. So with that, I'd like to open up and see if there are any questions uh, concerning uh, tariff classifications or the certificates we reviewed. Thank you very much, Charles. And yes, as Charles has, has indicated, if you have a voice question, uh, please press star 1 on your telephone. Also, if you have a written question on the upper left-hand side of your screen is an icon with the letters Q&A, and you can type in your question anytime um, during this webinar, and we will get back to you. So once again, I do encourage everyone to ask your questions now. We do have Charles on the line, and we also have Manuel from Monterey, Mexico. So if you have any questions pertaining to the government's um, services and, and help that we can provide you as well, uh, please let us know. Linda, if, if you give me a chance, I want to make one question to our friend Charles. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, what recommendation, Charles, can you give us when there's a controversy in each code? Because sometimes I notice when uh, the U.S. companies is sending their product with uh, a specific H S code, and when I arrive to Mexico, the custom broker or the custom agent uh, authority say, you know, that you change the H S code. What to do in that cases? Well, it does happen quite frequently, actually. You know, it, in my company, it happens all the time. A customer. Uh, even the importer will believe that this is a, that the particular uh, tariff number applies for his product. However, when it arrives here, you know we have to know the specifics, and sometimes they don't provide all that information, or there's no way. Uh, we received a shipment recently, a trailer load of chemicals, and okay. we were never provided a spec sheet for those chemicals. So it, as we're waiting for those documents, we can't test what is inside the, the box. We just know that it's some type of co compound chemical and we're waiting for the information. So a lot of times what happens is when we receive a good, we just don't have the, all the information required to make the accurate tariff classifications. And, there, and, and tariff classifications sometimes can be sort of a gray, a gray area. I mean, some things are very black and white. You know, uh, Pacific salmon is very clear and it's very easy to test. You can look at it and know that's a salmon and it's fresh and it's from Alaska. However, uh, chemicals, you can't look at it or smell it or, or, or touch it and understand what is it made out of, what's the compound. And that's really where the challenges come in is when we see certain goods that there's a lot of interpretation. The Marvel Comics example, for example, as, as a good example, here there is it a doll or is it a toy? And okay. what is the exact definition of what is a doll and a toy? It could be the importer says it's a toy and the exporter says no, it's a doll. And then you know a lot of these things can happen. Now, if you really uh, want to get down to the bottom of it, the best thing to do is to get your customs broker involved, or get if you have a legal department, get them involved and see if they will go to the customs to get a binding ruling. Binding ruling from customs means that they are they're they're willing to provide you in writing what their what their assessment is of the correct tariff number. This happens all the time in the U.S. and it happens frequently here in Mexico as well. A lot of our customers, when there's when there's doubts about what the the correct tariff number is, we will set up an appointment with a, with a port of, with the port officials here locally and go there, present them the product, uh, give them all the specs we can we can we can gather together. Explain to them all the details. We want to know what it is, what is it made of, what does it do, how does it work, where was it made, uh, what is it made of. And with all that information, we can ask customers to give their opinion, and they give us a written opinion that we can use to make sure that this is the correct tariff number for future crossings. Hmm. The fear is, of course, is that since it is gray, it's not always black and white, uh, those gray areas are open to interpretation. Tariff classification is how to interpret something. And one person may see something a little bit different than another person sees it. And that may even be between two port authorities saying things differently. So getting a binding ruling from the government will really help you avoid uh, these questions that will come. Excuse me. That's very um, informative. I have a, a piggyback question to Emmanuel's question. How long does a binding ruling process take? It depends. Uh, for example, the Marvel comic one, it took 10 years. Oh, uh, oh my God. <laughs> So 
The good thing is they can get drawback. I mean, after 10 years of fighting, and once they get their, the approval from the government authorities, they can go back and recover taxes that were paid under the wrong tariff number. They are, of course, not allowed to use the tariff number they want to use until they have the binding ruling. Mexican Customs, is a little, it can be a little bit quicker, but it's, you know, you, it'll take a couple of weeks to get an appointment with the authorities and then begin the process from there. It really just depends on, on, on how it easily it is for somebody to interpret. Marvel Comics, for example, said these were mutants, not humans. And so that's where it got into a lot of debate between them, is how do you know it's not a human doll, a human-like doll, which is what the doll, the, the description in the tariff number for, for the doll say it's human-like. So they were arguing that it is not human-like, it's a mutant. And they had to go through all this explanation with the U.S. government, with lawyers for 10 years, saying this is not a human, this is uh, something else. And it took them that long to get that ruling. There's really no, no, no definite limit, but I know a lot of cases where we've gone to customs, and, and within you know a couple of weeks we've been able to get a ruling from them fairly easily. It just really depends on how easy it is or difficult it is to interpret what you're presenting to them. Okay, great. Thank you. Once again, if the audience has a question, please press star 1. Operator, are there any questions? At this time, we're showing no phone questions. Okay, and I, I have a, another question. Um, uh, Charles, perhaps you can answer. So. Regarding those certificates, I know we get a lot of questions here at the U.S. Commercial Service on a 1-800 USA Trade phone number where people have specific questions on their certificate of origin, particularly the NAFTA certificate of origin. And I think one of the most common questions is if I categorize, you know, my um, product as being, you know, made in the USA, you know, with these certificates, what is considered validated proof or what is confirmed through customs as that whatever we put on that certificate of origin is, is the truth. Do you need a letter from the company? Do you need a warranty from the company about the, the HS number or the product with that HS number? What, what, does, what is customs looking for? Well, customs looks for, number one, the certificate of origin. Um, then after certificate, each trade agreement is going to be a little bit different. The way that the certificate is filled out and signed and presented, uh, some countries maybe they have to present one in an original versus another one that could send a fax copy. So every trade agreement is a little bit different. For NAFTA, uh, you know, we can receive a copy of the certificate. Uh, the, you know, if I can understand this correctly, you know, the, Biggest thing for us with the NAFTA certificate in our company is just they, you know, some somebody with no experience uh, decided to create or to, to put down the tariff numbers, and that's really the biggest problem we have. Um, recently, I had a customer who put uh, who was classifying herself a basket, a wire basket. However, when she looked up basket, she saw one and just grabbed the number, and it was actually for a wicker basket. And so, the tariff number for a wicker basket is never going to be the same as one as a wire basket. And so that's one of the most common things. But every every free trade agreement is a little bit different. So if you're shipping, you know, Mexico has trade agreements with many different countries, and the way that those are handled are very different for each of the free situation. Whether they're coming from Europe, Asia, um, or South America. Okay, great. Thank you. Once again, if you have a voice question, uh, please press star one. And any written questions. We will um, look at them later on, so if they come to you later after the webinar, that's fine. But um, please take this opportunity to, to ask your questions now while we have um, Charles here with us. In the meantime, if someone is thinking to make a question to Charles, I want to uh, take advantage and make other questions to Charles related to the uh, free uh, certificate of free sale. Uh, have you ever heard of a new changes on that? Because I heard that now it required uh, to re uh, to put an a frame from a uh, notary, I think, or notarize the document. Have you ever heard about that? Sure. Yes. It, 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 yes. Uh, you do need to provide a notarized. You know, these are usually coming from a local chair, area chamber of commerce, or they're coming from a state or federal government. The FDA normally is the, the, the federal body that would provide you with the certificate of free trade. But, yes, they are requiring these to be very original, uh, sealed, uh, certified documents being presented. It's a fear, of course. You know, if I were to invite you to my house 
uh, for something I cooked and I present it to you for to eat, but I've refused to eat it, you probably not want to eat it yourself. And that's basically what the government of Mexico is trying to say. And, and even the U.S. would require a free trade or a certificate of free sale if it's coming from Mexico and vice versa. Nobody really wants to feel that uncomfortable of consuming something, whether it be food or medicine, that, that wouldn't be consumed in, in, in the place that it's manufactured. Um, so there are getting more restrictions and more regulations regarding how um, certain items, especially food-related and, uh, and med- medical-related items, are being imported and exported. The U.S. government is also being very uh, strict, especially for food uh, items, making sure that they're compliant 100% with uh, phytosanitary and also the uh, certificates of free sale. But is mandatory that uh, you go with a notary or with the, these kind of lawyers who put the – is mandatory in Mexico? I haven't seen it as required mandatory, but that may be the direction that it's going. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Currently, Thank you. I think we just normally receive an original document from the exporter for the certificate of presale, and with that we can attach it to the manifest or the pedimento for crossing. But I do know that things are getting, especially in the area of food and medicine, those areas are getting more and more strict in the U.S. Customs and also in Mexican Customs. Okay. Thank you. And we do have an audio question. We have Jocelyn Rodriguez. Your line is open. You may need to unmute your line. Do we have Jocelyn? Okay, this is John for Jocelyn. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. We are a manufacturer of uh, full meters, and occasionally we have a requirement to send uh, samples or demo equipment to Mexico. Is there a special code for that, or, or how is that handled, and how is it valued? Well, normally, well, it depends on the value. Uh, for small importations, and I believe as long as it's, it's, it's worth less than $1,000 as an example being shipped, You normally just go through the un- – it, de- it depends more on your importer in Mexico. Does he want a formal entry? Is this an importer of record who wants to have a formal entry on, on the importation for the sample? Or is this uh, just an individual who wants to see a sample is willing to pay the duties, and taxes, and fees required for the importation? Um, you know, for, for informal entries, there's not a, really an after certificate that's apply- applicable, and you just basically ship it, you know, with a with – a, You know, depending on the size, I guess if it's a package service, you can you can ship it that way by parcel service, and they'll take care of that. If it is a formal entry, you would definitely use the tariff number for that particular good. We still have to classify it as specific to what that product is for shipping it overseas. And if it's worth more than $2,500, you still have to do the shipper's export declaration as well using the correct tariff number. So, and I'm I'm sorry, I didn't catch the part about the uh, the valuation. So, what I'm looking for is an informal entry, a small package. Uh, it might even be, uh, you know, a meter uh, for a salesman to take around and demo to customers. How much is it worth? Well, it could value, but uh, it could vary. But most of them are below two hundred, three hundred dollars. No, then you know, there's no formal. Uh, uh, there's no formal. Uh, entry into Mexico, and you have to do any uh, shippers or AES filing with U.S. Customs. This is below the values there. So I would say pretty easily just to ship it to the consignee in Mexico, and it'll it'll be processed through. There are there are duties and taxes to be paid, and those are usually done through the parcel company that clears the goods. So when you're on the Mexican side, just be expected to pay what the, you know, those duties and taxes based on what the classification is. And it's, you know, bad tax is 16%, and just based on what the product is, there'll be a, a assessed a duty for that. Great, thank you very much. And if we have any more voice questions, please press star one. Thank you. And currently we're showing no audio questions. Okay. Well, I'm not showing any more written, and um, I believe that's, that's all the questions we currently are going to have, but that's okay. Remember, For those of you who might have questions afterwards, um, please please contact us. Um, you can contact um, myself, uh, Linda Abrazizi at trade.gov, or Manuel Velasquez um, at trade.gov. And um, Charles, we will get you in, in touch with Charles 
um, also if you do contact us. Also, please check out our website at www.export.gov for more information on, you know, NAFTA and other upcoming events and also our webinar series. Once again, this is the first of seven that we will be holding here. And these are very interesting topics regarding the exporting, most important exporting questions that occur between the border of the United States and Mexico. I'd like to thank our speakers. I'd like to thank uh, Charles Redding for his expertise and time. I'd also like to thank Manuel Velasquez and John Howe from Monterey, Mexico for making this webinar series possible. Also, thank you to all of our participants. And please check your email boxes for more information on upcoming webinars. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Thank you. That does conclude today's conference. You may disconnect at this time.